Hello, and welcome back. Thank you for joining us again for another AP Laser Workshop. Um, I have Elisa with me as usual today. How are you doing today, Elisa? I'm doing all right. I'm a little tired, but well, I'm we're happy to be here. About to fire <laughs> it up for some, for, for some granite engraving today. Um, today, we're going to be covering uh, how to laser engrave on granite right. using light burn. Sorry, I forgot to mute myself. Um, <laughs> we're going to be doing laser engraving on light burn today, using light burn today. Um, before we jump into it, uh, Alicia is going to be doing some really good demonstrating using a photo and some, uh, some, some, some text and, uh, and going into granite. And we're going to show you a couple of different variations of granite that it might actually work, that it will actually work with. But I want to get into a little bit of the science behind the laser and how it applies to the granite. Okay, very specifically when we're talking about resolutions and DPIs and intervals or scan gaps, whatever you want to call it. Um, when we get into working with a laser, um, many of you know that the laser is reflected uh, from the tube across mirrors and uh, across mirrors and then it's condensed and uh, through its final mirror it's condensed using a condensing lens down to a point of concentration, which is our focal point. Most commonly we use a two inch lens, which is where our focal point is. So we have, uh, I'm sorry, derailed real quick. So the, the typical lenses we work with uh, that are available with our machine in the lens kit is gonna be an inch and a half lens, a two inch lens, a three inch lens, and a four inch lens, focal lens. What that is indicative of is not the size of the actual lens itself, but where the focal point is or the focal range of that lens is. What that means is that, for example, on a, uh, on a two inch lens, uh, the point of highest concentration of that laser beam at its point of its focus is two inches down from the focal lens. Um, what that does is it gives us a spot size. Every AP laser comes by default with a two inch lens. Um, that spot size is going to be, uh, is gonna drive our resolution. Now, a lot of you will hear of machines, they'll say, oh, we can run our machine at 1,000 DPI. We can run our machine at 15,000 DPI. We can run our machine at 500 DPI. All of that is true to an extent with most lasers um, CNC lasers and the AP laser. But what is important to know is while you may be able to use the motion at that high of a DPI, the, um, the effects of the laser and how the energy, energy is absorbed into the material is um, the driving factor on what DPI we should use. Not what we can use, but what we should use. I can drive a Lamborghini, should I drive uh, 200 miles an hour? Should I drive at 200 miles an hour? No, I should drive at 210 miles an hour. Uh, but we're not talking about Lamborghinis here. Um, with lasers, we're working with an exact science. So um, in theory, that, well, I, now you go from exact to theory. In theory, the spot size for a two inch lens could get down to 0 .003 or three thousandths of an inch, okay? that roughly translates into about 300 DPI. So what that means is that if we're running an image at 300 DPI, we're moving the laser head up a, ste a step uh, that is exactly the width of our laser beam at its point of contact. Now, for many materials, that is just fine, okay? If I'm doing a vector file, I actually want to create an overlap, so I might actually run that at like a 500 DPI mm -hmm. just to create a solid fill and I don't see any lines or definition in the engraving. But when I'm working with photos, it's very important to maintain an integrity of the image to where if I'm running it even at exactly 300 DPI, how it reacts with the material might make that point of impact a little bit larger than three thousandths of an inch. Okay, so I'm sorry, a lot of nerd talk here. I know it's not exciting for many, but it's important, okay? Um, so when I get into uh, DPIs or resolution for engraving, I prefer myself to run my laser engravings on granite at 200 DPI, because simply what's happening is when that laser hits the polished surface of the granite, 
it's creating a crater. So what was three thousandths of an inch is now going up to four, uh, four and a half thousandths of an inch. And if I keep running at that same level, I'm just creating an, what, what I call an overburn. So it will look like you're running it way too hot, mm -hmm. when in fact, if you just space it out just a little bit using like a uh, 500 or 200 DPI or 0 .005 interval, that gives you a little bit more space to where you don't see any lines or separation, but it allows you to preserve the definition in the image. And on granite, that's really going to be still very high definition, or what I would call high definition in, in the granite world. Um, still gives you a very good and clean engraving and looks, uh, frankly, better than pretty much you can do with any hand etcher. Uh, not taking any way, anything away from our hand etchers because that's a different science. Mm -hmm. But it's just going to give you extreme detail and it's going to preserve the integrity and quality of your image. Um, when it comes to power settings, it also matters a little bit on what we want to do with our final product. Um, when working with granite, a lot of times we're talking monuments and, and memorialization, uh, which might wind up in a funeral home. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to follow home guidelines. So a lot of you who are in the industry will know already that some funeral homes have very strict rules on types of moments you can use, colors of granite, types of, uh, um, you know, I'm sorry, whether or not you can use fills or litho paint or any other type of coloring or anything like that. Some places require that you have no paint or, or artificial filling or anything like that. So you just have to put something as a natural stone. So when I do that, I really prefer to use usually a lower power, um, just enough to etch the surface mm -hmm. and give me enough contrast so I don't totally blow out the image. But if I want to do an engraving on granite where I'm going to be applying some type of fill, litho paint or other patio paint or acrylic paint or fill to kind of give it a highlighting color, I might want to hit it a little bit more power to give it a little bit more depth, a little more blast out of the, the, the stone to expose a little more of the raw stone that w it will absorb the paint and hold it for a much longer time. Um, Frank says he's been using 150 DPI for two inch lens and 200 DPI for the inch and a half lens. That's great. Uh, that works for Frank and that works. Some images I still have to do at 150 DPI with a two inch lens. I think you might find that if you use a two inch lens and run it at a 200 DPI or even a 175 DPI, you might even get a little bit cleaner yet than the 150, but if 150 is what works for you, then of course we want to stick with that. But um, sometimes, especially working with uh, granite, less is more. It sounds weird, but um, if I run something at 1000 DPI and granite, I'm probably just going to have a, a solid kind of mess sometimes, depending on how much power I use. Sometimes it'll come out clean, sometimes it won't. It all depends on the layers and the image. And of course, there's a lot that goes involved with photo prep. So having said that and gotten covered a little bit of the science on it, what we're going to do today is going to be photo engraving with light burn. Okay? We're going to be using a mostly prepared file already, a stock photo. Now, we have done file before using Photoshop. We're going to do some stuff in the future. Look forward to it. Probably it's going to be a, 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 summer's busy. It might be uh, after July before we get into it, but we're going to start doing a series where we're going to do a Photoshop versus Corel where Alicia and I get to sit across from each other. She's going to do a photo in Photoshop, and while she's doing that in Photoshop, I'm going to do it in Corel. Okay? We've done a lot of photo prep videos. We're not doing too much of the prep today. We're mainly doing how to use Lightburn and some of the features of Lightburn on loading a, a photo and processing it in Lightburn and get it ready for the laser engraver. So if you want file prep, please, please look online for some of our videos we've already done on more extensive file prep and either on our YouTube channel or at the AP Laser University. Um, now, I could talk on and on and on in this slightly monotone voice and keep boring everybody, or I can turn it over to somebody who's got a little bit more life in them, and that's Alicia over here, who's going to help us out and uh, show us what she can, show us what we can do with light burn and laser engraving on the granite. I can say so. a little more life, but I'm feeling kind of like a zombie today, so we're going we're gonna to see how this goes. I don't know. You felt a lot more lively than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't but. have fed her the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, building off of that, um, 
a lot of what I have learned, especially with granite, this is a new kind of material for me. I've not done a ton with it yet, um, but a lot of what I have learned, I have either learned from different users in our different user groups on Facebook or through our old videos. Uh, being fairly new to the company, it's really nice to be able to look back on past videos and learn more there. Um, so it's definitely worth checking out um, those videos on our YouTube page. There's a lot of content on there that we've already covered that you may be looking for. Um, so it's definitely worth giving a look. Um, but I'm going to get back onto my computer here real quick. Okay, and we're going to go down and I'm going to open up Lightburn. And we're going to wait for it to load. Let's go. And as Aaron said, there is a lot that you can do before bringing photos into Lightburn, but there is actually a lot that Lightburn offers as far as photo editing goes that you can actually do quite a bit with, you know, just bringing that straight in here. Um, that being said, I've got my laser bed set up and everything. We're good to go. We're going to go ahead and we're going to go to import and I'm going to find the that I want to put in here. And we got this here. And I know, you know, when you think of granite, you're usually thinking of memorials, which are definitely one route to go. Um, we have a few samples here that we can show you as we go on um, that are the memorial focus. But we also do, you know, you it's a platform for pretty much anything. And graduation season's here, and I thought it would be fun to show kind of how to make, you know, a nice little gift. Um, so I've got this kind of stock photo here of a nice graduation picture. Um, you can see it's kind of a higher quality. Um, you can do the lower quality photos, um, but I think it's a little easier in light burn if you have kind of an already decent photo. It doesn't have to be super, you know, well done, but um, the fuzziness kind of is harder to work with in light burn directly. But since we got this here, we can make sure that's selected and we can right click on there and we can go down to adjust image here. We click that guy and we get this kind of big uh, little side by side here. It looks kind of weird right now. I do have this set as a negative image. Since we are going to be engraving on a black surface, we want to make sure that we are doing a negative etch. So we're bringing the whites out um, instead of the blacks since it is that black surface. Um, but to make things a little easier to see, this is kind of weird looking. You can go down to this menu over here and hit invert. And then you're going to see that a little better. That's what it's going to look like on the material when we're finished. Um, the inverted design is just what it's going to look like in the software. So this is easier for me to work with. As you can see, it's kind of, I mean, it's already pretty good. This is kind of the output of what we're expecting. Um, and things will look different on your computer than they're going to look on the material. Like Aaron said, you can bring, keep bumping up this DPI in here. I'm going to bump it up all the way to 1,000 if it'll let me. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. Oh, it kind of looks weird. But you can see it brings like every single detail out of that photo. And it looks great right here on the computer. But if we sent that to the machine and worked on the material with that, it's going to get super, super blown out. So no, that's not exactly no. what we want. <laughs>
we just need to cut it? We're going to have to stop it. I don't, I don't know what's going on with that. It's okay. Do we just need to cut it? Oh. I just got sound back. Uh, you got sound? Yes. I hear it. I just got sound back. Yes. I hear it. We're back. We're back. I have to mute my computer again. <laughs> Huge shout out to Tony behind the scenes working on this. <laughs> and Aaron. <laughs> We've got some good people on our team. <laughs> This is why you don't ever let anything update unless you're ready for it to update. <laughs> it wasn't his choice. It, it bites him every time. And we're going to try to dive deep into that and see if we can disable that auto update so also, we don't get bit again. Thank you for letting me know. I saw in the chat earlier where we dropped out. We were talking about the 1,000 DPI. So I'm just going to pick up there and we're going to roll with it. So let's go. <laughs> All right. So. As I mentioned before, you can blow this, whoa, that's way too high. Hold on, let me catch back up. <laughs> so down here in the bottom of the screen here, you can change that DPI and you can see where that's gonna change things on the preview screen here. And you can bump that all the way up to even a thousand DPI. It looks kind of funky in the preview, but if you zoom in, you can see just the amazing details that brings, right? Unfortunately, that's just in this digital view space. There are some materials that you would be able to get that kind of crisp, clean look on. Um, granite is not one of them that we have personally, at least I have not personally had success with. Every time we run that, if you run that at that high of a DPI, um, it blows things out a little bit. And I know, Aaron, you mentioned a little bit more on, explained it a little bit better than I on why it gets a little blown out at that high of a DPI. Yeah, again, I mentioned, I mentioned earlier that the, um, <coughs> what you run into when you overexpose granite, w w you'll hear the term burnout, overexposed, um, is you're just exposing too much of the granite and you're losing resolution, you're losing detail, which, that's what we want to do. It's, uh, this is, when we're printing on the granite, it's kind of like a dot matrix printer or we're printing a newspaper. We have to use dots to get our definition. But if we blur out all of the dots, we just have a blurry mess. And that's, at the end of the day, that's what's going to happen. So again, that's when I talked about the science in the beginning of the video. Um, if, you, uh, didn't, if you didn't catch that beginning or if you needed to, if you want to go back later and listen again, I kind of explained the science of how this is working. But yeah, that's why you just don't want to overexpose. It really just, it just exposes the stone more, which we want the detail in the image, so. And I will say, experimenting myself with this material for the first time, I got overconfident. <laughs> I really thought I was going to get that digital image, what it looked like on my computer screen, right onto that material. And it did not work out for me. It, it, did not look good. But as soon as I bumped that down, I think I ran that at about 260. Um, it, it, it looked awesome. You could see the detail still. It was super crisp and you could, it wasn't faded out like it would be at that higher DPI. Um, I, I'm going to play around with some settings. I'm going to start the DPI down here at 200 and we can kind of play with things from there. Things look kind of weird here. You can see the kind of dotage there. Um, but you can also see down here, this is where we're going to get into kind of fine tuning things. We have all these crazy little sliders and this is just doing the same thing you would do in, if you pre-processed your photo, um, but kind of, you know, slim down a little bit, makes things a little easier for you. Um, but as you can see, if we move different things around, it's going to start changing the way photo looks you can turn the gamma up and down that's going to kind of do some really crazy things you can up the contrast and kind of you know move things around a little bit there um, but let's kind of dive into making this look a little more presentable um, I like to go over here to start with the enhanced radius in the amount and kind of play with these sliders they're kind of co-sliders you can see right now we have these both turned on but if I turn this guy back down 
this isn't doing anything. We need them both at some sort of level um, for them to actually do anything to the image. Um, so I like to start, turn this up to a 10 here, and then we can play kind of with each slider as we need. I'm going to bump this guy up here. Kind of bring that out. And you see that kind of crispens, crispens. <laughs> it kind of makes the lines a little crisper and things a little bit easier to read on the image. And then if we bring the radius up again, you can see where that kind of makes things a little more cartoony. It looks more kind of like a drawing, but it's also making those details a lot easier to see. And when engraving, you kind of want it to be a little more exaggerated um, so you can see those in the final product. Um, not too crazy, like if I pop this all the way up here, it's going to look really weird. I probably wouldn't send it like that. That's a little too dramatic for me. But again, you just kind of want to find that good little middle ground. Um, and kind of work from there. I'm going to play with the gamma a little bit down here. And we'll bring that brightness down. And we're just trying to find a balance between each of these sliders here. You know, they're all going to play with different settings, but they all really work off of each other um, to find a nice little middle ground on everything. Um, and you can play with everything until you find what you need and work from there. I think this is a pretty good place to start. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And my cut layer so I can look at this here. I actually want to go in here. Kind of work with this a little bit. Um, and I think I'm going to change this to 0 0.004. So that changes the DPI to 250. So that kind of ups things a little bit. You could also change it in there. And again, we want this image to be inverted since we're going to be engraving on the black surface. Um, but to make things a little easier, just hit that guy there and then that's what it's going to look like on the final product. And you see, this is looking pretty good. I like where we're at there, so I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And we should be good. And you can see kind of on here where that changed things. And it looks a little weird on that raw image, but the the dithered image um, that you see in the preview and what it's going to look like on that granite um, looks a little bit better than just the, the raw thing there. I'm going to make sure also that I have this at the right size. I know the material I have ready to go is about, yeah, looks like that should be about right, 5.75 by 3 point. Yep, yeah, that should be good. Perfect. So we got that sized right. We have this in the image mode since it's an image. And then the speed and power settings that I'm I'm working with are black, uh, jet black granite here. I know we've got a little marker here and a kind of preview image that I've done before. The settings that I've done a couple of these on this material and the settings that I've found to really work for photos on our 100 watt machines is a speed of 20, a max power of 16, and a min power of 13. That's now, where the again, kind of sweet spot know, for me. That's, that's on our 100 watt machine. Right, right. And, and even 100 watt to 100 watt machine, those settings might vary very slightly for by your preference. Um, might also be your comfort level. You might want to run at a slower speed of 15, which means you might have to lower your power to 13. And uh, if you're using 2616, if you're using a 2616 or a 2816, a 2816 would be very similar to the 100 watt machines because most of those are 90 watt. 2616, those just be slightly higher in power, but uh, you just play with it a little to find those settings you need. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh no, that's <laughs> very good information. I will say as well, I have some little, you know, I've tested this out beforehand. I've run a couple pieces with these settings, so I know that it's going to work for me and this specific machine. Each machine is different. They kind of have their, you know, they all have their little quirks. Um, but I know this works well for me and the material I'm using. Sorry to interrupt you again. Alicia, no, you're fine. But, um, <laughs> this is a good time to mention that if you're looking into doing granite pieces, we have many, we have, we of course are, um, our parent company is Supernova International, uh, which is a granite wholesaler. And we, on our web store, we also have a, a vast, a, a very large selection of smaller granite pieces as well. So you don't just have to get monuments, but as well as the smaller granite pieces, whether it be this 
sl small plaque here, or we'll have circle. These are a lot of times these are inserts for different pieces, or you can just get different shapes. They're made from stock that way, or we have uh, paws and dog bones, and we have um, pet products and just a lot of different granite products available at a web store. Mm -hmm. But you can also buy blanks. You can mm -hmm. buy six by six and twelve by twelve blanks, to where you could just buy a case of blanks just to practice on granite with. And what a lot of my um, a lot of our AP Laser customers in the funeral industry uh, have started doing is a lot of them will take a portion of the photo they're putting on the monument and they will do a test on a six by six tile of the feature of that of the job they're doing and then they will um, once they have a good test on that granite and that small six by six tile they will they'll offer that to the family as like as an additional gift that the family wasn't expecting and a lot of times the families will ask for more of those for other parts of the family so but either way you can get you can get the blanks uh, that you can test with on a web store. Um, we're going to have a promo code available soon. Uh, we're going to be offering, uh, for viewers of this uh, workshop, we're going to have 10% off all the granite purchases on our web store. Um, I will get that posted very soon. If I don't get it by the end of the show, I thought I was already going to have the code. We, we, I will get it out to everybody. Uh, it will, it'll probably be on the user group which would be kind of cheating for people who didn't watch, but I'll actually, uh, I'll just put it in the title of the, we'll, put, we'll, do, we'll figure out a way. You'll get the code later to get 10% off for a web store. But that's aplaser.com slash shop. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Alicia. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> kind of building off that as well. Another way, if you know, if you don't have that test granite handy, um, another good thing to practice on is actually just blank uh, black poster board. You know, just simple stuff you can get at the dollar store. Um, it's really good. You're going to use the same settings that you're testing for the granite piece. Use those exact same settings on that poster board and you're going to get a pretty good idea of what the end result is going to look like without having to run that directly on the piece first. So you still get, you know, a good idea. It is going to look a little bit different on the granite just because of those different flex and everything in there um, that poster board obviously doesn't have, but it gives you a good idea of where things are looking what you need to tweak and like we said if you're going to get that you know kind of blowout it will show on that poster board as well so you're you'd have a good idea of if you need to lower your dpi if you need to adjust your settings you know and kind of work from there um, and you can just get that it's just any black poster board i think i used when i did my test i used a crayola poster board for like a dollar fifty and that gives you like a big sheet you can do the full size, you can bring that down to do little tests, um, but it is going to look a little bit different on that final material. Um, so I do recommend having just kind of little tiny test pieces, as Aaron mentioned, um, just to have those. And then you can give those out as well as kind of little freebies to get people more interested and invested in your business as well. Okay, going back to my computer here, I think we have everything set up as far as this image goes. Um, you can kind of see where you can actually do a lot of that processing directly in Lightburn. You don't have to pull open Photoshop. You don't have to open Corel. Um, you know, you, it is absolutely something that you can do, but it's not completely necessary. Um, you can do a lot just directly in this laser program. And again, that is one of the reasons why I love Lightburn so much. It's definitely my go-to. I definitely recommend it when people ask. Um, it's worth the investment for sure. Um, to spice things up a little bit though, I do have like this big open space over here and I think we could fill it with something. So I think I'm gonna add a little graphic in here to make it a little more, you know, personal and uh, kind of make it more graduation gifty themed. So if I go to import, I'm gonna bring one more little thing in here. I've got this little vector ready. You can't really see it because it is that black vector there. If I pull it in here, you can see it's just a simple class of 2023 vector. Cool. We got that year on there. It makes it a little more personal. Um, it's not just the random photo. It has a little bit more meaning to it. Um, but instead of just running that as a photo, I'm going to turn this into a graphic so we can go down to trace image here, or a vector, sorry. Um, and we can see all these pink lines here is where it's going to trace that image. Cool. 
everything looks great to me. If it did look a bit off, just like we did with the photo, you can play with the sliders here um, to get things to your liking. And then once you're ready, you can hit OK. I'm going to get rid of that original photo, and then we just have this graphic here. Cool. I'm going to resize that to where I want it to be. And we're going to place it over here. We can play with that and, you know, just kind of put that wherever we want it to be. I think that looks good. So that's great. And then one last thing I'm going to do. I've got this size here. Okay. I'm going to make a little rectangle here. I'm going to change that width to be the width of the photo. Do 3.8 here for the height of the photo. Let's change my cursor back to the selection tool. I've got that selected. And then if I hold down control and, cl and click on that photo, we can go up to the top here and hit this little target. And that'll put it right on top of the photo here so that it's aligned perfectly. And then if I go ahead and hide that photo real quick, I can select everything on my screen here. This little group of guys up here, put them together. And I'll show you, this kind of seems like a weird tangent right now, but it's going to be really cool, I promise. Actually, let me backtrack for one second. Before I connect them, I want to make another one of these guys. Okay. Make them connected, show my photo here, and then what I'm going to do is select everything on my screen, right click, and go down here to apply mask to image. And you can see where that brings that part of the image out, so it's not going to be engraving there. And it looks, I think it, it adds a little something to it. And then we can flatten that image mask so that that is the image now. It has that out of there, um, and it's all just kind of one thing together. But to spice it up, one little thing real quick here as well. I, co I went ahead and made another copy of that vector. I'm going to align it here. We have a little guy over here just to do a little outline. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And then we want to change this. Right now it's set to line. Obviously we cannot cut through the granite. We don't want to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to change that to a fill. So it's going to fill all of that in there. Perfect. All right. And then when I go back to my preview here, look at that. I think that looks great. So it kind of adds a little something to it. Um, you know, and you could put whatever you wanted in there. If you wanted to put their name or if you wanted to put, you know, a, their specific school or anything like that. It just kind of adds a little something to it. Um, and I think it's a, adding that um, the photo frame around it makes it a little cleaner and a little nicer, but the settings for that are going to be exactly the same as the settings for the image. Everything looks good. We should be good to go. I'm going to go ahead and turn on the machine real quick and let that start up. And if you didn't see our last video, I think it's really worth watching. Um, I am now networked to our machine so that I don't have to have a cord you know, from here all the way to the machine. It gives me a little bit of freedom, and I'm really loving it. Um, I'm set up for the machine, so we should be good to go. And if I go ahead and hit send, and I'm going to say uh, grad, that'll be the name of this. Cool. Go ahead, and that's sending over. No cords. We're wireless. <laughs> I, I'm loving it. <laughs> it brings me a lot of freedom. Um, so cool. We got that sent over. Should be good. I'm going to get this set up real quick. If there's any questions or anything you'd like to talk about, Aaron, be a good time to do it. <laughs> Go ahead and make sure I'm level. Yes. And well, she's back there. What she's talking about is uh, she's back there saying at the job. Um, at last week's AP Laser Workshop, uh, um, the, the video is out there. Uh, I went into how to network your machine. So it really will give you a lot of freedom in um, accessing your machine. Um, you can. Sorry, you can um, 
you don't have to be attached to the machine. I personally don't like using my stand in my machine. I don't like standing up next to the machine all the time. If we're on our feet all day, enough as it is, sometimes I want to sit down, I want to work. I, I want to use the same computer for the same thing. So I'm going to sit down at my desk. I'm on the network with my machine. I'm going to prepare my file, then I'm going to load my file, and then I'm going to send it to the laser. And then I get up and go over to the laser, I'm going to uh, get everything in position and set up and start it ready to go. So right. uh, if you didn't check out last week's workshop, it is available online. And uh, it's how to network your machine. And there's even a little nugget on there on how to, uh, on how to, uh, that you can actually go wireless with your machine if you need to. So it requires an additional purchase. And again, that wireless feature is not supported by AP Laser Tech Support, but um, it's fairly simple. And if you have trouble with it, um, I can give you some limited support with it. You'll have to reach out to me through the AP Laser Live at aplaser.com. That's AP Laser Live at aplaser.com if you want um, my personal assistance with the networking. But just know that I am very busy, so I would have to, I'll have to set an appointment with you when I do that, okay? Um, but I'll be more than happy to do that just to help out our support team as well. So. I see there's a question. What settings did you say you use for the engraving, Alicia? Is that what, it, what sense is that? I'm pretty sure that that's what he meant. What settings? I, I think Paul's <laughs> experiencing the same over-aggressive autocorrect that I am, so. For settings I use for, uh, this is our jet black granite that we offer in our store. Um, the settings that I found to work with the 100 watt machines that we have is a speed of 20 and a max power of 16 and a min power of 13. And this works best for photos. Um, I've experimented a little bit. I haven't found my sweet spot exactly for, you know, straight text. It does work pretty well, but, you know, I think it's, this is more specific for the photos. He did uh, clarify, his question was actually what lens? Oh, not lens, sense. okay. So let me, uh, let me use this to get back into the science because um, it's a really great question. Mm -hmm. We are using a two inch lens. Like Frank mentioned earlier, he will use uh, 200 DPI for an inch and a half lens and 150 DPI for a two inch lens. That's his preference. So that does, uh, that dev does definitely indicate that you can use an inch and a half lens for granite. Now me personally, if I'm going to be doing granite uh, for an exterior monument, okay, I'm going to be looking for a little bit more of a blast, a little more of a, um, I don't know, for lack of better terms, a harsher impact. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use a two-inch lens and stay around. I'm still going to use around uh, one, 150 to 200 DPI for my uh, interval for my engraving. Um, but if you use the um, if you use the inch and a half lens, it's going to give you a, a more detailed engraving, but it also has a lot less margin of error. And unfortunately, if you're working with a bigger stone, sometimes when they polish them, the surface itself isn't going to be completely flat, and you might actually get some variations in the engraving. So you always need to use caution when using the inch and a half lens. Okay. Frank also asks, why is your cabinet door open? That scares me. So let me, uh, I'm also the laser safety officer for uh, AP Laser. And let me get into the safety of the laser, and I want, everybody first of all to understand that we are only doing this for demonstration purposes we are all trained professionals do not try this at home okay disclaimer out of the way um, <laughs> well everyone is while well, everyone is concerned with the safety of the laser and they absolutely should be I want everybody to understand that um, I've been working with the lasers for 10 years okay I have one scar and I got it this year when I was working physically working on a machine and I touched a wire and it shorted and it made the laser fire and it shot my hand. But I was a, a technician working on that laser, okay, and it just burned a little bit. It didn't even hurt. Weird. Um, cauterized, it didn't bleed, it was kind of fun, but in a weird way. So what I want to say is that uh, you'll hear a lot of people talk about scattered radiation and um, dangers of that. Well. That's nothing more than light radiation, okay? What you're really worried about is if you're doing metal, you definitely want to be cautious, make sure you're wearing eye protection because off of metal, we might get reflections and stuff like that. 
But once that laser beam has scattered, it's not posing a risk. It's non-ionizing radiation, okay? What does that mean? Well, X-ray uses ionizing radiation where the electron actually breaks away from the, um, from the molecule, whatever, and, and can actually do damage. That's why you have to limit yourself to ionizing radiation. But non-ionizing radiation, uh, with this wavelength, the laser and other light sources, whether it be LED lighting and stuff like that, is for lasers, particularly the non-ionizing radiation, is the electron expands into orbit and then it collapses back down. And that collapse is what creates a photon, which creates the energy that is, it, when all the other excited molecules, light, light amplification through stimulation, um, Emitting radiation, emitting radiation, sorry, acronyms, but um, uh, the, all those photons fall in line, unex, unexplicably fall in line behind each other and create a near parallel line, which gives us a laser beam. So the only time that is truly dangerous is if you put yourself right in front of it. If you, if you put your head down in there and look at the eye and you override the safety feature and push fire, um, don't buy a laser. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, don't do that. Um, that's basically the biggest thing is the direct contact and safety, of course. We always want to run the, the, the laser for safety features. We are running hours open for demonstration purposes and video purposes, but um, AP Laser will not be responsible for anyone who is defeating safety uh, interlocks to run their lasers. So I appreciate the safety concern, but I don't want people to be like, terrified, so terrified the machine that they're afraid to touch it. Uh, it is definitely respect the safety concerns, but don't be terrified of the machines. So That's a really good explanation. I never really thought about it that hard before. That's, that's awesome. Frank, our reflective <laughs> light, burns not, uh, light beams not dangerous to your eyes. The reflective light beams are dangerous to your eyes. So if we're reflecting it off the laser or off the mirror, then yeah, we're still concentrating. If we're reflecting off of granite or wood or cardboard, it's scattering radi it's scattering uh, it's scattering that beam into nothing more than um, what you're going to get from an LED light overhead. Um, the the light the, the, the concentration is such to where the energy is not going to be as dangerous uh, to be able to react with things. So that being said, when I uh, the metal. Uh, you definitely want to be wearing eye protection. When you had the cover shut and all the safety locks are in place anyways, uh, acrylic is opaque uh, to a laser beam, so a laser beam can only go through it once it burns through it. So, um, but in this environment, uh, if you see, we're not putting our face into the laser, we're not jumping onto, uh, into the laser beam. Um, and again, this is only for demonstration purposes, but definitely do not run your machine with the door open. Um, we gotta do things a little more experimental sometimes, but as Aaron said, he's the king of safety here. He's always gonna make sure we are. Nothing's wrong yet. I mean, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong yet. <laughs> he's gonna make sure we're A-OK. -okay. Um, as that's finishing up, it looks like we're just about there. I do want to talk a little bit about LaserCon. I know specifically if you're interested in granite and memorial design, we're going to have an amazing speaker there. Buxton's coming and he is, it was Matthew Paul Buxton is. We have a, a, a yeah. several very good speakers. Matt Buxton is one of the ones, uh, he's the kind of guy you can just hang out with, but also he's going to share all of his knowledge and he wants to share all of his knowledge. He is the opposite of greedy. He wants to give away every knowledge he's learned over all of his time. And he wants to help as many people as he can be successful. Great speaker. Um, Tong speaking. We have a couple of other people who are going to be speaking that are very good speakers. Let me find that list again. I know I was just looking at it. Um, while I'm looking at it, I mean, if you don't, if for, I mean, speakers aside, it's at Red Rock in Vegas. I mean, what, what more reason do you need to go? It's I'm excited. Go to, go to Red Rock in Vegas and write the whole trip off. And I know it's a work trip. But this is my first time going out there at all, so I'm very excited. I'm also excited. I'm going to be running a customization station there is what we're calling it, where I, you just bring me what you want, tell me what you want engraved, and I'll figure out a way to do it for you. So I'm excited to do that. <laughs> so listen to this lineup. This lineup is, uh, okay, of course, we're going to have the, I'm going to, 
I mean, he is, you know, the leader of our family here. He's one of the greatest, greatest employers I've ever worked for. I really treat him like family. Our CEO, Tong Lee, is going to be there. Uh, recession proof your business. Okay, let's talk about Tong. How many business owners do you know that when he hears that customers are unhappy, he's out on social media just throwing his cell phone number out there saying, call me, call me, let me help you. Um, he's gonna be there, he's always, he's always smart, uh, always has great things that listen, he, will, he wants to help your business as well. And he's gonna be talking specifically about how to recession proof your business. Uh, amongst all the other things Tong likes to talk about anyways. We also have Ellie Harward, a new market, a new market, home interiors and event rentals. Okay, we're also, uh, like Alicia mentioned, Matt Buxton is going to be there. And a lot of you want to enter into the memorial care industry. He's going to be talking about that. How can you get into monuments and stuff? Bonnie Gilbert's going to be there speaking. Uh, Jeremy and Holly Gross and Brandon and Nicole Smith, as always. Some of my favorite people, they're all family to us and they're all wealth of information. We're going to have uh, great team there. I'm going to be there. Come see me. Um, again, LaserCon, if you haven't signed up already, please sign up. We're going to have a great time. And if, I'm, if you're not there having a great time with me, that's on you. Um, thank you again, Alicia, for your great demonstration today. Thank you all for your patience and sticking with us while we work through our audio problems. One, you know, occasionally we get things where uh, technology stays with us, but uh, and we don't have the problems. We're going to get there now. And, huh? oh, <laughs> yep, sorry. <laughs> so quick, here's a piece that just finished. Oops. Here's, here's a piece that just finished. <laughs> See? <laughs> See? Okay. All right. Let's Webcam. Here. here we go. Right, so there we're we go. That just came out. out a piece. Okay. <laughs> that is a good test tile piece there, right? So we're like, oh, that works perfect. Let's go ahead and put that on our bigger piece. Okay, and tell me that that wouldn't be a treasured gift at an open house or graduation party. Uh, and like I said, that, that was just run with the settings from Lightburn. There was no pre-processing done in any of the other programs like Photoshop or Corel. So it is possible just to pop it in there without that photo editing knowledge. It, it's more accessible than you think it is, but you know, there's a lot you can do. Um, there is some post-processing you can do to bring things out just by filling that in with a little bit of just craft store paint. Um, doesn't have to be anything special, but like Aaron said, you know, if you're doing monuments, you know, look into the restrictions in your area or wherever they're going to be going. But yes, with that uh, said... Hey, if you're looking into doing monuments, you got to come to Laser Cut to listen to talk to Matt Buxton. He's going to tell you everything you need to know um, to get you started. Uh, thank you again for joining us all. If you have any questions, please shoot us an email at aplaserlive at aplaser.com. That's aplaserlive at aplaser.com. Thank you all. See you in two weeks. Two weeks. Next week, we're taking a break. Uh, kind of a holiday thing going on. Then we're going to have limited crew. Uh, we're taking a break next week, and we will be back the first week of June 7th. And I think and we're going to be, be doing, doing glass. glass. Yeah, I'm excited. We're doing glass. We're going to be doing glassware, glass panels, glass stuff, and stuff. Glass. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. Um, uh, see you at the next workshop. Thank you again.